It seems as if there have been more financial scandals recently, and in this video we're going to look at two examples. The first one is a hedge fund that blew up, that's Archegos Capital, and the second one is Greensill, which is about trade finance. Now what's common to both of these is that they occur in a particular sector, and what we'll be looking at is how to avoid the pitfalls which could lead you to invest in that kind of scheme. Now, if you do want to learn more about investing, a great way to do that is as part of our Patreon community. To find out more about that, just click on the link in the description below me and beside me. So let's look at those financial scandals in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Both of the scandals we'll look at come from the shadow banking sector. The definition of shadow banking is that it's the kind of activity that traditionally would have been done by banks, but which is now carried out by new intermediaries. And the key difference is that these entities aren't as heavily regulated as banks are. Here you can see Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of one of the biggest American banks, which is JP Morgan. And I thought his letter to shareholders in 2021 would be a great place to start this video. And one of his key points in his 2021 letter is that a lot of activity has moved out of the regulated banking sector into this larger shadow banking sector. And as he describes it, the quantum of risk, i.e. the amount of risk that's around in the system, hasn't changed. All that's happened is that it's moved from a regulated space to a non-regulated space, which is surely a recipe for more scandals. Now, JP Morgan is particularly heavily regulated because it's considered to be something called a SIFI, a systemically important financial institution. After the global financial crisis, it was generally agreed that these SIFIs would have to hold more regulatory capital. That's because they sit at the centre of the financial system. And if they go down, they're just too big to fail. So they had to ensure that these banks wouldn't fail. And central banks across the world have been very successful in ensuring that investment banks, particularly the SIFIs, have managed to shore up their balance sheets with lots of loss-absorbing capital. That's primarily equity and retained earnings. And here are two measures that the Fed uses to gauge that systemic risk from banks. The top one is the ratio of tangible bank equity to assets. Remember, the equity part is the part which absorbs losses. If the value of the assets of a bank shrinks by more than the equity, the bank is bankrupt. And what you can see is that since the global financial crisis, the amount of tangible bank equity relative to assets has generally increased. And if we look at the common equity tier one ratio, which is another measure of loss absorbing capital, again, you can see that that's generally been going up very sharply after the global financial crisis, and currently it remains at high levels. Now, what that meant in practice through this pandemic was that banks were able to lend throughout the crisis and they didn't make the crisis worse. And the Fed uses a slightly different acronym here, which is GSIBs. These are global, systemically important banks. Now, what Jamie Dimon is complaining about is the fact that there isn't a level playing field. While investment banks are heavily regulated in every activity which they perform, often by more than one regulator, that's not true so much of non-bank intermediaries. So, for example, as a GSIB or a SIFI, JP Morgan has very high capital requirements. It has to have a lot of equity on its balance sheet. That means that it can't take so much leverage, and in turn that means it can't generate such a high return on equity as it has done historically. It also has to hold operational risk capital. This is the risk that the bank's systems may fail and cause a cascade throughout the financial system. Whereas, as we saw, companies like Robin Hood don't have operational risk capital. They just wing it and recapitalize as they need more money. Investment banks have extensive liquidity requirements, but that's not true of non-banks. And the list just goes on and on. And there's a beautiful table in the letter, which I've turned into a bar chart here, where Diamond compares the size of banks and shadow banks in trillions of dollars. So here they were in 2000, and you can see that the shadow bank sector was bigger even then. Then in 2010, it became very clear that the shadow banks were growing much more rapidly than the banks. As we look at it now in 2020, the size of the shadow bank system is over $60 trillion. That's more than twice as big as banks. 
So how big are these shadow banks? According to Diamond, the biggest category would be things like exchange-traded funds. It may be strange to think of ETFs as part of the shadow banking system, but remember that when you buy an ETF, you're providing capital for companies, either in the form of equity capital or debt capital, if it's a corporate bond ETF. And money market funds, because they buy things like commercial paper, are providing short-term credit to companies. Now if you look at any newspaper you'll see how quickly things like ETFs are growing. So this isn't a problem that's getting smaller and in fact the rate at which the shadow banking sector is growing is accelerating over time. The economist John Galbraith came up with a brilliant phrase which is called the bezel which seems to capture our times very well. The word bezel is just a contraction of the word embezzlement and it's an inventory of the amount of money which is undiscovered which has been embezzled in businesses and banks. And Galbraith's point, which is a great one, is that the size of the bezel expands and shrinks with the economy. So during periods when money's abundant, and of course interest rates are low at the moment, and we've got huge amounts of personal savings, then people tend to take more risk, and the size of the bezel grows. But then during a period of depression, usually a lot of these bezels come to light. And that's because people become much more cautious. If someone asks for money, you become much more suspicious of that person and they have to prove that they're honest. Audits are done more carefully. And when money's tight, commercial morality is enormously improved. So although we have had some scandals recently, I personally think that the bezel is still growing rapidly because money's still widely available and people are still taking a lot of risk. Our first example will be Archegos Capital. This is Bill Huang, and Archegos Capital was a hedge fund he set up to manage his own personal wealth, which was considerable. And if you watch this video on YouTube, you'll see that that choice of name is driven by his own very strong personal faith. And unfortunately for him, he's become the poster boy for what happens if you take too much leverage. Or as Bloomberg Businessweek put it rather unkindly, how to lose 20 billion in two days. And the recipe they give for making that loss is a combination of swaps, which we'll see in a moment, but also leverage. And that's when you borrow money to invest money. That amplifies your gains, but also your losses. Now what triggered the implosion of Archegos was that some of his investments lost value. Now if you just buy a stock and hold it, that's not a problem. But if you buy a stock on leverage, you can get something called a margin call. That means that you have to pay up your losses immediately. And if you haven't got enough capital to do that, then you have to sell some of your assets to pay the margin. And if you hold really large positions, your forced selling can actually trigger more selling in the market. So it becomes a negative feedback loop. People first got wind of this forced deleveraging, as it's called, because they noticed some very large sell trades being placed by investment banks. And the types of stocks which Archegos had been buying were Chinese tech stocks and US media groups. Now, when market makers in the equity market see someone who's forced to sell, they rub their hands in glee, because this means they can mark down the price massively and rip the client's face off, to use the colourful phrase which the trading desk often uses. Now, this isn't because Huang was new to the market, far from it. He was a seasoned hedge fund manager who'd done incredibly well in the past. However, in 2012, he admitted wire fraud when he was trading Chinese bank stocks, and he had to pay a very large fine of $44 million to settle illegal trading charges. So it was somewhat surprising to see that many investment banks had taken him on as a client in their prime brokerage business. And if you're wondering what a prime brokerage is, it's kind of like Robin Hood for individual investors, but with many much more elaborate services, and in particular, the ability to have a very large amount of leverage. Now, one of those premium services that you get if you have a prime broker is something called a total return swap. So let's say you want to buy $100 million worth of equities. You could just buy them and hold them on your own account, but in a total return swap, you don't have to pay the full amount. Maybe you just put down $20 million and then the investment bank, your prime broker, would lend you the rest of the 80 million. And the actual shares themselves would sit on the balance sheet of the bank. Now, if you don't want other people to know what's in your portfolio, then your trades would effectively be secret because it would look as if your prime broker is holding those stocks, because it is. They actually sit on the balance sheet of the investment bank, the prime broker. Then what happens 
is the prime broker will pay you the returns of that portfolio as if you actually owned the portfolio. So if the share prices go up on a given day, then the prime broker will make a payment to the hedge fund. And if the value of the hedge fund's portfolio falls, the payment goes the other way, from the hedge fund to the prime broker. But what happens if the hedge fund hasn't got enough money to pay the prime broker? Because the share price has fallen so quickly and so much that it doesn't have enough capital to meet that payment. Well, in that case, there could be a forced liquidation of its assets. And it looks as if that's what happened with Archegos. Now, it turned out that Archegos had multiple prime brokers. So each of them knew about some of the positions which the fund held, but not all of them. And as usual, Goldman Sachs got out early and made the smallest losses. And that was reflected in the very small fall in its share price once news of this came to light. Whereas Nomura and Credit Suisse took massive share price falls because they turned into the bag holders as they didn't close out their positions quickly enough. And the FTs reconstructed a portfolio which Archegos could have been holding with stocks like Viacom, GSX, Baidu and so on. And if you assume 5 to 1 leverage, there were incredible returns in 2021 as those stocks rallied because of the leverage. But then also because of the leverage, the fund was very quickly wiped out. So I think the moral of this story is if you're tempted to take too much leverage, don't. For the vast majority of investors, taking any leverage at all probably doesn't make sense. And it may well wipe out any gains you've made if the market turns against you, which eventually it always does. And no scandal would be complete unless people got fired. And here you can see Credit Suisse's chief risk and compliance officer, Lara Warner, lost her job, as did Brian Chin, who was head of Credit Suisse's investment bank. But it wasn't just this scandal which caused heads to roll at Credit Suisse. Oh no, it also involved a second scandal. And that was Greensill Capital. Now, Greensill Capital was involved in trade finance. So kind of like a Bach fugue, we'll start off simple and then we'll get to the full-on financial engineering, which got Greensill into trouble. We're all familiar with business-to-business -business transactions where you have a buyer of goods and services and a seller of goods and services. The buyer buys something from the seller and then agrees to pay them, say, 90 days in the future. And then 90 days later, the seller receives their money. But wouldn't it be great if the seller could receive their payment more quickly via an intermediary? And that's where factoring comes in. And the intermediary is called a factor, such as Greensill. So just as before, a buyer buys something from a seller. But now what happens is that the seller sells their invoice to the factor. And in return, they're paid a little bit less than the invoice price by that factor immediately. So in order to receive their money more quickly, the seller receives a little bit less cash than it would have from the buyer itself. So eventually the factor has to be paid, so they collect the full invoice amount from the buyer. And then we're done. The buyer has their goods, the seller has their money, and the factor makes a small profit. Now there's a variation of this called reverse factoring. This starts off in the same way. So the buyer is buying services, possibly from multiple sellers, but then the factor agrees with the buyer which sellers it's going to pay immediately. Then the factor pays those sellers, and eventually the buyer repays the factor. But the innovation which Greensill came up with was based on something called prospective receivables. So the dialogue with the seller would go something along these lines. They'd ask them, who may buy from you in future? And then they'd ask, how much might they buy? And then Greensill would provide that money. In other words, the factor is now providing cash for receivables which have never been received. So that's why I've put the buyer into a dashed line here. This is a potential buyer in future. And the factor is providing cash based on that potential receivable in future. Now, if that buyer materializes and they actually pay the seller for the receivables, then all's well and good and they can pay the factor. If the buyer doesn't materialize, the factor would simply roll over the loan. Another factor which widened the scope of this scandal was how Greensill funded its loans. They did this in collaboration with investment banks such as Credit Suisse, creating something called supply chain finance funds. Just as before, the buyer would buy something from a seller and the seller would sell the invoice to a factor, but then the factor would sell the rights of that invoice 
to a special purpose vehicle. The special purpose vehicle would then issue a note, like a bond, and then that note would be bought by high net worth individuals who were fully aware of the risks they were taking. The cash raised in the purchase of those notes by the high net worth individuals would then be passed on to the special purpose vehicle, which would pass it on to the factor, which would then pass it on to the seller. And just as before, the buyer would pay the factor and the money would be siphoned through to the high net worth individual. So on the face of it, this was a fairly low risk investment from the point of view of the high net worth individuals. And the reason why was that there was insurance protecting the capital provided by third parties, by insurance companies. And in fact, if you look at some of the Credit Suisse fact sheets, it explicitly says that the underlying credit risk is insured by highly rated insurance companies. But the problems really started when the insurance company started refusing to provide that insurance. And one of the first insurance companies to do that was Tokyo Marine. Now, more than a thousand high net worth clients of Credit Suisse actually were invested in these products. And you can imagine their horror when, at the beginning of March this year, Credit Suisse suspended redemptions. They couldn't take their money out of the funds. According to the FT, some of those funds have been reclaimed, so they have regained some of their money, but certainly not all of it yet. And the total value of those funds is around $10 billion, but that's only about 2% of Credit Suisse's assets under management. Tokyo Marine said that they reinsured their risk, so they won't necessarily be one of the bag holders for this loss. But just like everything else in finance, there's a great Warren Buffett quote, and of course, Berkshire Hathaway is a reinsurer, and in his letter to shareholders in 2001, he said insurers must therefore apply a stress test to all participants in the chain. And he sums it up by saying, you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. Now, the scope of this green seal scandal is probably going to involve some politicians, in particular David Cameron, the ex-Prime Minister of the UK, who is actually one of the advisors for green seal. And it's not just a UK scandal. There's actually a court case against Greensill Capital, which is being filed by the West Virginia governor, Jim Justice. And they're claiming in the lawsuit that Greensill committed fraud. So on balance, I'd say that the size of the bezel is still increasing. And the reason for that is that money is still freely available. Interest rates are still low. Fiscal policy is still pumping lots of money into the system globally. And people are still very keen on taking risk. But at some point, that's going to end. The fiscal policy will get tighter, as will monetary policy. And I suspect we'll see many more of these scandals come to light. And all I'd really suggest is that you don't take too much risk, not too much leverage, and that you can make perfectly adequate returns by simply buying equity and holding on to it. If you enjoyed that video and you want to support us, you can now do that directly via YouTube. There should be a join button, which is underneath this video or you can click on the link beside me. And if you do support us that way, you get a crown next to your name, which appears in every comment you make. We do try and answer your questions first. Also in the YouTube Lives, you'll be at the front of the queue when we answer questions. And Teddy is just showing you how beautiful that crown can be. And as always, thank you for listening.